So good morning, everybody. And it's it's really good to see you, and uh, it's really good to have the opportunity to share something of God's word with you this morning. Um, and wasn't it wonderful to have all our young people praying? This There's something special about listening to you know, your children pray, and you know hear how they see and what their faith is, and uh, that was really cool. And I always enjoy the musicians. I was with you, Walter. I was like, let's send the collection around again <laughs> a few times. Thank you so much. So um, you can turn to Psalm 90. Uh, thanks, Dane, so much for reading that so well. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time there, but you can just turn there and keep your finger there. And uh, here's a question for you. Um, I hope I'm not the only one. Do you ever feel like life is getting a little bit more crazy and chaotic? Ever felt like that? No. Have you ever had an experience or faced a situation where everything was going kind of okay and then suddenly it felt like part of your life just fell apart? Uh, Many of us have had that kind of experience. A few months ago I had an experience like that. Uh, the company that I had worked for for nearly 23 years told me that I no longer had a job there. And for two weeks, we faced the prospect of not knowing where work was going to come from or how I was going to provide for my family. And it was luck. Luck falls apart a little bit, right? Uh, not a lot took care of that situation. Um, so we've moved on from that and everything's fine. but. Whether it's a work situation, whether it's our health, whether it's the health of a loved one, whatever it may be, business prospects, um, something happening to our house, all of us at some stage have or will face a situation where it just feels like our lives, a little bit of it at least, is falling apart. Life really is becoming more and more chaotic, isn't it? Um, the background of the generator is like SA sort of theme song now, right? Infrastructure just continues to fall apart. Uh, government just seems to lurch from corruption to corruption. Uh, there's wars. There's always been wars, but we get to watch these wars on TV. And add to this things like the increasingly extreme weather, uh, the ravages of COVID, the deterioration of our economy, uh, lower job security, and a higher cost of living. It's no wonder that a survey in America showed that now four out of every 10 adults are admitting to signs of depression and anxiety. We live in a crazy world. It's so crazy, in fact, that scientists and sociologists have come up with an acronym to try and describe this world. You may have heard of it. It's called VUCA. V-U-C-A. It stands for a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. That's a tough world. In fact, this was a term first used by the U.S. military at the end of the Cold War. And never has it been more true. And so as believers this morning, the question we've got to ask is, what do we do? In a crazy, chaotic world, this VUCA world, how do we turn? Where do we go? How do we get some stability and certainty in our lives? How do we get simplicity and direction? And the fantastic news is the answer is in this psalm, in Psalm 90 penned over three and a half thousand years ago by Moses. And he gives us a very clear and straightforward answer right there in verse 1. He tells us we need to make God our dwelling place. We need to make God our home. Let's have a time of prayer. Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and uh, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for your word, Lord, and the truth in your word. We just thank you that you are our dwelling place. 
that you are our home, Lord, and in you we will find everything we need to survive in this crazy book of all. I pray this morning that as we go through the message, Lord, we can appreciate and acknowledge your presence in our lives, the power of the presence in your lives, and that we can cling to you as your children, as believers. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just remind ourselves uh, of Psalm 90. We're just going to read verse 1 and 2. And we're going to focus mainly on verse 1 actually. Uh, Verse 1 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all the generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. What a wonderful prayer that uh, Moses would pray later. So in the psalm, he actually eventually describes God and he describes man's lot at the time. Um, He's talking about Israel and he's writing actually at a time that's close to the end of their 40 years of wandering the desert. Uh, They have seen many of that generation die out. And he, in the following verses ago, he talks about all the trials and temptations and how temporary life is. And then he ends up in the psalm actually praying that the Lord would invoke repentance in the nation so they could come back to dwelling with Him and they could reap the rewards. Um, And in fact, the psalm, I guess my my alternative title for it is that it's like a state of the nation. It explains who God is and God's intended relationship to us to be our dwelling place, but how man has wandered through sin away from it and the desperate cry that Moses has to, for the nation to come back. It's the same state of the nation today. God is still our dwelling place, but we have gone astray and we desperately need to repent to come back to Him. And it's quite amazing actually. Remember at this time, the nation of Israel is wondering. They are effectively a nation with no permanent home. They're a nation without a country yet to call their own. They're effectively a nation of refugees, moving week in, week out, from place to place. It's quite incredible that in the midst of all of that, we get this stunning reminder of where we find our stability and our security. So what is our home like? What is dwelling with the Lord like? How is that the answer to our crazy Buka world? So we're going to look at three aspects of our home. And then we're going to talk about how do we dwell with God. So the first aspect of our home that we're going to look at this morning is that our home is a place of stability. It's a place of stability. Justin Trudeau, you may have heard of him, he's the Prime Minister of Canada. And in 2018 at the World Economic Forum, he famously said this statement. He said, the pace of change has never been as fast, yet it will never be this slow again. Pace of change has never been this fast, but it will never be this slow again. As people, we actually like a level of consistency and predictability in our lives. I don't know about you, I I like that a lot. I like to know that certain things are going to happen and are predictable. And so change is hard. Constant change is very hard. Especially when it can be scary, when it can have negative consequences for us. Actually then change isn't hard, it's just scary. And especially when it's unexpected, when that thing comes along, that event happens. There's a a story I'm reminded of. We had some visitors recently we will keep them nameless to protect their identity. But uh, they had come over for an early supper and we had decided, Lisa and I, that it would be a great idea to sort of as a appetizer to have some cheesy nachos. Nothing fancy, just nice nachos and cheese malted over. So we planned ahead, we checked our load shedding timetables and we set the time, four o'clock. This is when we're gonna do cheesy nachos, it'll be cool. 
and our guests arrive and four o'clock comes and we've said well we're gonna just make the nachos now and as we turn to make the nachos the power goes off load shedding timetables are switched just like that and when the load shedding hits our microwave does not work so I don't know about you but I was stumped like how do you make melted cheese if you don't have a microwave but as they say, necessity is the mother of invention, and it turns out that you can make delicious cheesy nachos in a frying pan. <laughs> and uh, what my amazing wife figured out is that the way you've got to do it is you just put the cheese first, put the nachos on top, and then let it melt, and then you just turn it out upside down, and you have cheesy nachos. So you're welcome to try that at home. It is delicious. But boy, that minute when the power went off, it was a good reminder of how change can be scary. But today it feels like nothing stays the same anymore. Um, you know, my dad used to always, or well he still tells us every now and then, you know, one of the only constants in life is change. Uh, I think my boss topped that this week. She said, the only constant now is not change, it's crisis. So what do we do about it? Well, friends, when we dwell with God, Remember that you are dwelling with an unchanging God. A God who never changes. In Malachi 3 verse 6, God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Pretty straightforward. In Hebrews uh, chapter 13 and verse 8, we read that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Friends, God does not change. It doesn't matter what the load shedding timetable is. It doesn't matter what the weather has happened. It doesn't matter what's going on in your day. He doesn't change. God doesn't get older. He doesn't age. He doesn't mature. He doesn't change his mind. You know, well, today you get a blessing, but tomorrow not. He doesn't forget. He's eternal. He is bankable. He is completely trustworthy. I was trying to think about how do we really bring that home? How do you try and illustrate God's unchangeable nature? And uh, one of the things we're blessed with living in the Cape are amazing mountain ranges. And uh, we're fortunate enough to live quite close to some mountains. And every now and then you can go out and have a look at the mountains. You know, on a crazy day, sometimes it's nice to just go out and just... And they just seem so implacable, so unchangeable, so like they've been there. But um, I wonder if you ever looked at the mountain and wondered, well, what did it look like like 10 years ago? Is it like that? Now, many of you who've lived here will know. It hasn't changed. Yeah, the greenery is a little bit different, but the mountain's still a mountain. What about 350 years ago, at the birth of our country? Well, the mountain's probably still much the same, maybe a little greener. What if you go back 2,000 years? Well, actually, I wouldn't have expected the mountain would be too different. It wouldn't have changed shape or anything. Maybe the vegetation. Go back 5,000 years. How do you think that mountain will look? Very similar, actually. You'd recognize it. Now I get this. Verse 2 from Psalm 90. It says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God as immovable and unchangeable as the mountains themselves feel, God is even more unchangeable. He created them. He put them there. He made them like that. Our God is unchangeable. And so what does it mean? Friends, it means that no matter our circumstances, we have a sure hope in our God who doesn't change. And no matter how things change, no matter even how we change, he doesn't. The way we spoke to him yesterday is the way, the same way that we pray to him today. The truths that we learned in his word last week are the same truths that still stand this week. The grace that he gives us to do well yesterday is the same grace he gives us today, even when we fall. The love that he has for us yesterday is the same love that he has for us today and the salvation that he has offered us 
It's the same salvation He offers every single day. Whether it's today, 300 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. Our Lord is the same. He does not change. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's like an amen. And that gives us stability and security. Not the world and the load shedding timetable. And that, that's where we get our stability from. From our amazing God who does not change. In the world, they hope for stability and a lack of things happening to be secure. But as believers, we hope in the, um, the unchanging God. And we know we are secure. The world is volatile, but our God never changes. We live in a home of stability. Another thing about our home is that it is a place of serenity. It's a place of serenity. It's another word for peace. In September 1938, the British Prime Minister at the time, a fellow called Neville Chamberlain, is very famous for declaring that they had achieved peace for their time. This is after he and other allies had concluded a diplomatic agreement with none other than Adolf Hitler. History, of course, tells us that that was a bitterly ironic thing to say because less than a year later, Hitler's invasion of Poland began World War II. For the world, peace is all about avoiding conflict, about negotiating. Stopping the fighting. And he's just demonstrated that we've never actually achieved it. Uh, today, unfortunately, there is a massive war happening in the Ukraine. There's no diplomatic resolution that's going to help that at the moment. A closer to home, we don't even need to think about war, but we think closer to home. I think any of us with uh, more than one child knows that it is a monumental effort sometimes to keep the peace at home. That needs a lot of diplomacy. The interesting thing is that when we study the Bible and look at the Bible, the biblical meaning of peace is actually quite different. Uh, yeah, there is a little bit of the absence of conflict in it, but actually it has a far richer meaning. And according to Baker's Evan Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, uh, the biblical definition of peace actually has four different parts to its meaning. Now, of course, in Hebrew, it's the word that we're familiar with, the word shalom. And actually, the word means to be complete or to be sound, to be whole. And it's got four different answers to it. The first way that um, the meaning can come across is actually to mean a wholeness of life or body. It actually means to be healthy. That's part of the meaning of peace. Another meaning is to have a right relationship or harmony between two parties or people. When our relationship is sound. You can see peace is about a sound relationship between us and God. A sound relationship between us and others. Peace also has the idea, this word shalom, of prosperity and success. So it has a blessing component to it. And then, the fourth part is that Shalom also has the idea of victory over one's enemies or an absence of war. There are times in the Old Testament when you look through the history of Israel and Judah where um, God gives kings a time of peace. No war, no one comes to invade you. But it's not only that. Sometimes the enemies come and peace is about having victory over the enemies. And so actually when you put that all together, peace isn't about not having conflict so much as it's about having a sound and right relationship with God through Jesus Christ which then leads to blessing and victory over the things and the conflicts in life. Does that make sense? It's not so much about please don't let anything go wrong. It's more about because we have a sound and whole relationship with God we are able to thrive despite conflict and to have victory over those threats and enemies in our lives. Peace with God is possible because Jesus paid the price for our sin. And He allowed us 
to be restored into a right relationship with God, then we experience peace with God and we experience God's peace. We have peace with God because our relationship is restored, but God himself is at peace with himself. We get to experience that peace in our walk with him. Uh, John explains this in John 14, 27, where he says, this is Jesus speaking, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We have access to God's very peace. And so we can see this is a peace not based on things going right, this is a peace based on righteousness. On having that right relationship with God. Uh, this is a peace only for those who are saved. We don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. This peace is not available to us. And so it's a peace that is based on righteousness. It's also a peace that's reinforced by trust. A peace reinforced by trust in Philippians 4. Verse 6 to 7, we have those well-known verses where Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, we have access to the peace through our right relationship with God. And then as we trust more and more of our lives and our needs to God, we experience that peace more and more. Peace that defies circumstances, that surpasses human understanding. Think about when Jesus went out to the disciples in the Sea of Galilee and that storm came. When was Jesus sleeping? He was sleeping during the storm. Not just during the calmness. The storm did not disturb his peace. Actually, the disciples panicked. In their panic, they woke him up and he calmed the storm. How could he do that? He had peace. That is how powerful God's peace is. It trumps all our circumstances. It doesn't matter what's going on. Those things will come and they will happen. Um, we can have peace in the midst of it. We can become the calm when others are at sea during those storms. And so we must dwell with our Lord. We must dwell in our home of peace. So our home is a, is a home of serenity. It's a home of stability. The third thing about our home is it is a place of support. It's a home of support. Now I don't know about you, but in my view, today we live in a world that is wrecked with guilt wrapped with guilt we just don't like to show it and it makes sense right as society and humanity go and continues on the path of doing what is right in everyone's eyes and doing whatever we want to do and there's more and more sin and the consequence of sin is guilt in fact I would go as far to say is that we live in a time where there is an epidemic of guilt there's a piece of research that I found, a deeply ironic piece of research, a study published in the British Journal of Psychiatry that reviewed data from 22 published studies and, get this, found a link between abortion and mental health difficulties. It took a study for people to realize that. This study was done in 2017. And it found that women who had undergone an abortion experienced an 81% increased risk of mental health problems. That's interesting, but here's the kicker. I found another stat. It estimated that in 2020, one-fifth of all U.S. pregnancies were aborted. One out of every five. That's just that issue. What about all the other countless issues we all deal with? We know the people we know deal with. There is an epidemic of guilt in our society. And it impacts us as believers. We also deal with guilt. Um, I think this is one of the main reasons why people everywhere are struggling. You're struggling with guilt. You have no ability to deal with whatever life tosses at you. COVID epidemic and all those kinds of things. 
Now, the Bible has a lot to say about guilt. Very interesting, though, it says very little about the feeling of guilt. Normally, when we talk about guilt, we're talking about that feeling. The Bible does talk about that. Actually, it talks about guilt in a different way, mostly. And so there's two parts of guilt. The first part of it is that guilt is actually a state or a status that comes about when we have transgressed a standard, some ethical or moral standard. So it is primarily a state or a condition, not a feeling. Uh, so, for example, in Romans 3, uh, verse 10, where it says that we are all guilty before God, it's not meaning we all feel guilty before God. It means that we are, in fact, in a state of guilt before God because we have all transgressed. Okay? Then, secondly, because we are in a state of guilt, we have feelings of guilt. Uh, Adam and Eve are a good example. They were in a state of guilt because they had sinned in the garden, they had transgressed God's law, then they felt guilty. And they did things that tell us that. They hid away from God. Uh, they blame shifted. And all those things that come along with the feelings of guilt. Another thing about the biblical idea of guilt is that guilt is very really tightly tied to the idea of relationship. So it's not just that you've transgressed something, you've done something wrong, and there should be a consequence of that. It also is strongly connected to the idea that when you do that, you have created a breach, a break in a relationship with someone else, that other person you have offended. That could be God, that could be somebody else, um, or, or all of them. And so there are two parts to it. We've done something wrong, and there is a punishment for that, but we've also created a breach, a break in a relationship. And so. You know, when we read that we're all guilty, it's saying we all have broken that relationship with God because of our state of guilt. Now, the feelings of guilt are very important because they are there for a purpose. Not to make us feel bad, but to drive us to repent. We need to repent of the thing that we are guilty of uh, in order to deal with it. Uh, and David speaks a little bit about this in Psalm 32. Um, he says, when I keep silent, my bones wasted away through, all, through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was set as in the heat of summer. Does that describe the feeling of guilt? Yeah, absolutely. He then goes on to say, then I acknowledged my sin to you and, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Those feelings of guilt have a very specific purpose. They to drive us to repent. It's interesting the way that last bit is phrased. You forgave not my sin, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Friends, this is a wonderful thing about our home. When we dwell with God, this is not a home of recrimination. This is not a home of condemnation. This is not a home where the Lord sort of looks at you and just goes, this is a home of forgiveness. Isn't that amazing? This is the wonderful thing God has done for us when we became believers. When we put our trust in that salvation that is offered to us through Jesus Christ, an amazing thing happens. God changes our status. Immediately and forever. He changes our status. So think about it. Today we're quite used to this idea of having a status, right? If you go onto Facebook or some of those other social media, WhatsApp, you can write your status. But what we may not have realized is that we've always had a status. And Romans 3.10 told us that that status was guilty. You can imagine that all of us at some point were wandering around with the status above us, glowing in red, saying guilty, has transgressed. But when we are saved, in the twinkling of an eye, that status changes. And it goes to a pure white, and it says, righteous. Righteous. That's the amazing thing God does for us. He gives us a status of righteousness in an instant. And it's a permanent status. You cannot undo this status. In fact, there's nothing you can do to change it, because that status rests in Jesus 
and Jesus sits at the right hand of God in heaven. And does Jesus change? No. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have a permanent status of righteousness. Isn't that cool? That means our guilt has been dealt with. It's gone. Even if we sin again. So when we sin as believers, we don't lose that righteousness, but we still breach our fellowship with God. That horrible feeling where God suddenly feels far away and you feel disconnected. That's our fellowship with Him. But we never lose our righteousness. And we just follow what John tells us to do. 1 John 1 9, we confess our sins. And God is faithful and just to forgive us and He cleanses us. And in an instant, our fellowship is restored and we're walking with Him again. Anytime. But our status never changes from righteousness. Now this is important because I think today, it's, at some time, many of us will struggle with false guilt. You know that situation where we've confessed and we've asked for forgiveness about some sin perhaps in our lives, but we just don't feel forgiven. We don't feel like it's working. Uh, John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, struggled with this for years. He actually eventually lived in terror that he had committed some unpardonable sin and that there was just no forgiveness for him, despite everything that he had learned. And he would confess his sin over and over and over again. And he eventually was basically a nervous wreck, um, sort of stuck between this horrible guilt but this terrible fear um, of dying, he actually writes. We feel so worthless. We feel so unworthy of God. We feel like actually it's impossible to forgive us. Maybe others, but not us. We feel hopeless. Sometimes it's that sin we fall into again and again. And eventually we just feel like a loser. Friends, I want you to understand this is not God's plan. God's plan is not for us to feel guilt. That way. This is the devil's plan. And this is what he does. If he manages to trip us up that we sin... His next move is always to absolutely drown you in your guilt. He is the master of drowning us in our guilt. He will pull up every failure, every moment of regret, everyone you could possibly think you've let down, and he will play that movie to you over and over and over. That's the devil's plan. But remember, our Savior is always stronger than the devil. There's a very nice little story that illustrates, I believe, God's forgiveness. The story goes about a pastor, and this pastor in his, in his past had sinned very badly. And even though he had confessed his sin you know, at that time, he never quite felt forgiven. And there's a lady in his church, and this lady had always had a habit of saying, The Lord said to me, da da da. And it wasn't that he didn't believe her, because she was usually right about the things she said the Lord said to her, but she really irritated him. So one day in frustration he said, Well, if God is speaking to you, ask him to tell you what it is, what it was I did years ago. You can just imagine. You know, thinking, yeah, that'll sort you out. But a few days later, she came back to him. Well, he said, Did you ask him? Yes, she replied. Well, what did he say? Asked the minister. I love her answer. She said, He said, He doesn't remember. He said, He doesn't remember. Friends, that's the thing to remember. When we dwell with the Lord, we dwell in a house of forgiveness. God has said that He separates our sin from Him as far as the east is from the west. Have you ever thought about it? God's omniscient. He knows everything. So it's actually an amazing act for him to deliberately forget something. But the minute we are forgiven, that's what he does. What does that mean? It means that we've got to stop dwelling on our sin. Here's the headline. You are the only one doing it. God moved on long ago, the minute he forgave you. He's not dwelling on it. He didn't remember. There's a, a famous saying that says, quit looking at your sin and start looking at Jesus. 
That's what we've got to do, to dwell in our house of support. Jesus is not there to accuse us of our sin or remind us of our sin. He's there to support us and forgive us of our sin. And so we dwell in a place of support. And our dwelling place is so many more things. It's a wonderful place. It's a home of supply where God meets our needs. It's a home of assurance where we can trust His promises. It's a home of safety where we are in God's hand. But the part we want to close with now is how do we make our home with God? If our home is all these amazing things when we are dwelling with God, how do we, how do, we do it? How do we dwell with God then? And actually it's as simple as A, B, C. A, B, C. A. Acknowledge the truth that God is always with you. Acknowledge the truth that God is always with you. You might say, well, yeah, I acknowledge it. Yeah, He's always with me. Okay? No, it's easy. No, we don't mean it like that. Do you realize that He is with you in every situation? He's with you right now. Do you acknowledge that? Do you acknowledge that He's with you? Do you realize it? Do you make it true in your life? When we leave this building after the service, we get in our car, He's there. Right? Uh, when we go home and someone cuts us off, and we kind of yell at them, God's there. Uh, when we have a meal later today, He's there. When we go and relax, maybe we sit in front of the TV, He's there. Maybe we surf the web or check some social media or spend time with friends or go to visit family. He's there. He's wherever we are. He's there. Do you acknowledge that? When our world is rocked by illness, He is there. When we lose somebody we love, He is there. When our financial security feels like it's in tatters, he is there. When we feel alone and like no one in the world cares we exist, he is there. When we face ridicule for what we believe, he is there. There is nowhere we can be. There is nothing we can do that he will not be there. Jesus said in Matthew 28, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In this crazy, chaotic world, friends, we need to start acknowledging that God is always with us in everything we do, in every situation, in every moment. We need to say, wait, you're with me, you're here. We need to acknowledge Him. That's A. Next one is B. B stands for be with him. Now to explain this, I want to invite you to try out a little metaphor, a little illustration with me. But you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit. Okay? So I want you to imagine a nice house. A comfortable, nice house. It can be, maybe it's in the country on a lane. You know, maybe it's, it's, it's somewhere nice on a street. This house is the house of your life. So it's a nice house. Let's walk into this house. You're in the living room. It's a very comfortable living room. You've made this a comfortable living room. Maybe you have a fireplace, maybe not. Maybe you have comfortable furniture. There's a kitchen, there's bedrooms, there's all the things you need in this house of your life. There's one more thing that makes this house amazing. Is someone else in the house with you? Who may you ask? Well, Him. Our Lord. Our Savior. Jesus Christ is there with us. We say it, remember? We just remember, Jesus has told us, I will be with you. So here we are in the house of our life, and He is there with us. When we're making food, He's with us. When we're in the living room, He's with us. When we go to sleep, He's there. When we wake up, He's waiting for us. We spoke about our A being acknowledged. Could you imagine in this house if you just lived and ignored the fact that Jesus was there the whole time? Wouldn't that be weird and crazy? 
But that's what we do sometimes, right? So when we say acknowledge, remember, He's there with you. Every place. Now we talk about be. Be with Him. Well, there He is with you. What are you going to make? What are you going to do with Him? Are you going to talk to Him about your life? About the things that are going on? Are you going to share with Him um, what's happening in your life? Maybe you're going to talk to him about your spouse, your children, your family. What are your hopes and dreams for your children? What are the things you want to work on in your relationship with your spouse? Maybe you want to talk to him about work. There's that issue, that boss, that colleague, that person. Do you ever share your fears? Do you share your dreams with him? Do you ever just tell him how amazing he is? Appreciate him. Thank him. Do you talk to him about your fellow people? The ones we're praying for. Even the ones we don't pray for. You really watch hours and hours of Netflix and all that stuff when you know that Christ is there with you. We have an amazing home when we dwell with the Lord. Actually, all this time, He has been dwelling with us. We just need to realize it. We just need to respond to Him. And make him part of all the things we're doing in our house. He's right there. We need to be with him. Acknowledge him and be with him. And then sometimes things go a little bit wrong, right? It's like we're in our house, but suddenly we look out the window or the door and we just see something really interesting in the street. Maybe it's a new pursuit, or maybe it's a promotion at work. Maybe it's those really cool people we've always wanted to be with. Maybe it's that thing we've always wanted to do and not been sure if we should. And suddenly we're not in the house. We're out in the street. Busy with that thing. But we're out in the street now. We're not with the Lord. We're on our own now. Doing this thing. I know in my life, part of that was career. I was building a whole career. It's like I was out in the street with bits of cardboard trying to build another house. And somehow I believe that that had some security. We all have something that we're doing out there. The problem is the street's not safe. The street's dangerous. It's also dirty. Yeah, these gutters, they're filled with junk. And there's all sorts of things that are not good happening in the street. The street's not where we want to be. This is a prize then that at some point after calling us, our Lord will say, okay, I think I need to bring them back into the house. He'll just let something go wrong in the street. Maybe it's a storm, maybe it's a wind, maybe it's a flood. And all of a sudden we realize, wait a minute, I'm out in the street. What am I doing? I've been wasting my time with this thing. And we turn and we see there's the house. And here's the wonderful thing about that. Is the house, the door is always open. And in the house, the Lord is there and He's waiting for us. And we go into the house and we confess. So sorry, Lord. You did this thing. Please forgive us. And you know what's wonderful? The Lord doesn't say, oh, He did it again. He doesn't say, oh, I'm so disappointed. In my house, he just smiles. And he says, you know what? I'm so glad you're here. You were talking to me about that job. Why don't you tell me some more? And we just keep going in our fellowship. We need to acknowledge our Lord. We need to be with him. And when we find ourselves out in the street, all we have to do is confess. See is confess. And we'll be right back in the house. My friends, I hope that picture helps you to illustrate what it means to dwell with the Lord. We have an amazing dwelling place, an amazing home with Him. A place of stability, of peace and serenity. It's a place of support and forgiveness. Sometimes, though, we find ourselves wandering out. And that's when we have to get off the street, get back home, and dwell with our Lord. It's as simple as ABC. Let's close in prayer.
Father, we just thank you that you are our dwelling place, Lord. As Moses said, throughout the generations, and you will be. We know one day you will be eternally our, our dwelling place as we dwell with you physically in heaven. But even as we are here on earth, we thank you that we can be at home with you. We thank you for the amazing home that you provide us. Lord, help us to realize when we have drifted off, when we've become distracted, when we're out on the street, as it were. Lord, thank you so much that you are quick to forgive. Help us to confess. Help us to acknowledge you in our lives and help us to be with you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.